born free. If you'd like to know more about the life of Matt Monroe, you may also enjoy The Singer Singer, The Life and Music of Matt Monroe, a biography by Matt's daughter, Michelle. Also available is Words and Music, an abridged audio version of the biography, along with rare audio clips and video performances on a custom-made USB memory stick. See the links in the YouTube or Mixcloud description for more details. Yesterday All my troubles seem so far away Born free As free as the wind blow From Russia with love I fly to you There could never be A portrait of my love To my mind she's my kind of girl This is the life Here's where the living is Come with us, run with us We're gonna change the world You'll be amazed, so full of praise When we've rearranged your world We're gonna change your world Hello, I'm Michelle Monroe, and welcome to the last of four very special programmes on one of England's most underrated singers of the 1960s. From a poverty-stricken upbringing in war-torn Britain to a steady rise to fame as a beloved entertainer, this series is an intimate portrait of the man behind the voice, drawing on previously unbroadcast interviews, extremely rare recordings previously thought lost, interviews with his family and friends, and messages from some of his more famous fans. This is Matt Monroe, the boy from Shoreditch. Matt now had fame all over the globe. He continued to tour in the USA, Australia, South Africa, South America and the Philippines to name just a few. As the 60s came to a close, as well as from Russia with Love and Born Free, he recorded what many perceive to be one of his best movie themes and it's still one of the most requested tracks on radio. Questi giorni quando vieni Il bel sole La 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 On days like these When skies are blue And fields are green I look around And think about what might have been And then I hear sweet music float around my head As I... Hello there, this is Quincy Jones. As we celebrate the life of the great Matt Monroe, I cannot help but remember when he recorded on days like these for me when I was doing the score for the Italian job, and man, he absolutely smashed it. His musical chops and heart made him the artist we love and cherish so much. And when we lost our dear Matt, we lost a truly great artist and human being first. In honor of his 90th birthday and the 60th anniversary of his first hit, Portrait of My Love, I hope that we will never, never, ever, ever forget the music he shared with us from the heart. Those decisions were made in heaven. My eternal love to you, Matt, and your beautiful family, brother. God bless you. It's on days like these that I remember singing songs and drinking wine while your eyes play games with mine. On I wonder what became of you. Matt's next move was a live BBC television special from London's Talk of the Town. His act included the third and final song attributed to Terry Parsons, the singer's original name. This time, the lyrics were all his own work. 
Engelbert changed his name. His future seems to flower. A bowler and a cane brought John Steed his fame. But Patrick Wymark needed power. I'm telling you, Caswell, we're going to form a consortium and you can do what the hell you like. So you will say, I must find a way. To make the name of Matt Monroe stay I'll paint a portrait of my bus one day It's a matter of A simple matter of It's just a matter of Association Of course, like so much of Matt's television and radio work, that special no longer exists in the official archives. But luckily the clip was rescued by a fan who recorded the special using a microphone next to their television set. As you can hear from his Patrick Wymark impression, Matt was also a bit of a mimic. Just once in a lifetime A man knows a moment one wonderful moment When fate takes his hand And this is my moment My once in a moment Well, there's nobody to let somebody Love you So find yourself somebody Keep those letters and cards coming in. Yeah, Matt was essentially a, ca- a good cabaret artist and he had a, a really smart line and patter. And he used to do impressions of people from time to time as part of his act, you know. Um, I think it's, it's like it's a kind of forgotten art now amongst singers. Impressions of Anthony Newley and Dean Martin from the singer's late 1960s stage act. The new decade started with a release that would be championed by a famous DJ and ultimately caused the end of his shortened tenure with Capital. Although a departure from his usual recordings, Matt loved the track and having spare time at the end of a session, laid it down. Gulped down her breakfast, shut the fridge and joined the throng Margaret Beatty snatched the milk and scanned the news and went along Annie Harris drew the curtain, screwed her eyes up, had a beep Saw the marchers, heard their voices making early morning noises Stumbled back to bed and tried to sleep Come with us, run with us we're gonna change the world, you'll be amazed So full of praise, when we've rearranged your world We're gonna change your world It was Kenny Everett who turned it into a turntable hit, changing the original release into a double A side. He absolutely loved it and played it constantly on his radio show. Being a born prankster, he wasn't adverse to having a little fun with it along the way, as this excerpt from his Radio 1 show demonstrates. From the world, the nation, and the Texas News Triangle, this is Hourly News. It's just been announced that there's going to be a musician's strike. Until we hear more, here's some music. Would have gulped down her breakfast, shut the fridge and joined the throng. Margaret Beatty snatched the milk and scanned the news and went along. 
Everybody out. Annie Harris drew the curtain, screwed her eyes up, had a beat. Come on. Saw the marchers, heard their voices making early morning noises. Stumbled back to bed and tried to sleep. Come with us, run with us. We're gonna change the world. You'll be amazed, so full of praise. When we rearrange your world, we're gonna change. <laughs> Knew he couldn't keep it up. Across the Atlantic at Capitol Records, things weren't going quite so well with the song. And they cocked that up as well because uh, I took it to the States, you know, and everybody said, yeah, baby. I went walked into a board meeting, actually. And they're all sitting there with their feet on the desk, smoking and drinking coffee and donuts. And they're, yeah, baby, that's great. And, uh, and they took it away and they added... Uh, what we need is a little more rhythm there, and uh, the brass could pick up a little earlier. The extra brass was playing the wrong figures. What is that? If you listen to the English original and the American version, it's a different record. They cut out a whole chorus, and the bloody song just doesn't make sense. Anymore. When you say they're playing the wrong brass figures, what do you exactly mean? It's out of tune. It's terrible. It's a dreadful record, the American record. What made matters worse? was that the overdubs took place at Capitol Studios, at the exact time Matt was working across town at United Recording, with what would turn out to be his last tracks for the company. He was furious, and subsequently the label eventually agreed to withdraw the single and put out the original version, but the damage was done. After five years, Matt left Capitol and re-signed with EMI. He was happy to be back working with George Martin, but Johnny Spence was now in great demand as an artist himself, which left Matt working with a string of different arrangers. The location of the session started changing as well. Although he still occasionally recorded at Abbey Road, the majority of his studio work took place in George Martin's brand new state-of-the-art studios, Air London, based in Oxford Street. George and Matt looked for more contemporary material to record, although with so many people writing their own songs, it was more difficult to find an original that hadn't been covered by anyone else. So it is very, very difficult. I mean, the other thing, which was a, a big smash hit, which I would like to do, is um, for the 1st of May. Mm. Yeah. It's a beautiful song. Yeah, it is. Beautiful song. But it was done by a group, and it was, I don't know whether it was a big hit or not, but uh, it's contemporary. When I was small and Christmas trees were tall we used to love while others used to play Don't ask me why The time has passed us by Someone else moved in from far away Now we are tall And Christmas trees are small And you don't ask the time of day But you and I Our love will never die But guess who cry Come first of May The singer was booked into Air London. The session included five tracks all pinpointed to go on the new album for the present. Dad took me with him which was very exciting as it was the first time I'd been to the studios with him. The studio was Bedlam. There were people running back and forth, as well as 40-odd musicians trying to tune their instruments. But suddenly George Martin tapped his baton, and everything went instantly quiet. Dad beckoned me over to him, held my hand, and started singing to me. That recording was the one actually cut to disc, and it was such a special moment, the memory of which has stayed with me throughout my life. The added thrill to me when I recorded this was the fact that my daughter was actually in the studio with me, holding my hand when I sang it. I make no excuses for calling the song Michelle. Michelle, my bell, these are words that go together well, my Michelle. Mm, Michelle, my bell, sans les mots qui vont très bien. I love you, I love you, I love you That's all I want 
to say Until I find a way I will say the only words I know That you'll understand There is a little postscript to that story. About 10 years ago, I came across Dad's music case, which had sat untouched ever since his last concert. It contained all the band parts for the songs he was performing at the time. Carefully placed in a compartment at the top of the case was George's handwritten score of Michelle from that recording session. Dad had carried it with him for the rest of his life. George very kindly signed it for me with the note, Your dad would have wanted you to have this. Love, Uncle George. In 1972, George explained to his friend that he was stepping back and lessening his role as producer while he concentrated on his new company. We never actually recorded a bad song. Oh, there may be some that weren't hits, but they were still singable songs. They were still good songs. And it's sort of material that I can still use in my act today. And people do still associate me with those songs that even weren't hits. Well, Matt was a great personal friend, apart from being a very fine recording artist. And uh, we had many happy memories together. Uh, he lived life very fully, and he was a very happy man. And he had a great family, but um, it, was, it was a real privilege to work with him and, and to, to know him so well as a person. Marvellous man. This time we almost sung a sunny tune Well, didn't we, girl? This time we almost made it Right up to the moon Well, didn't we, girl? And this time We almost made Our poem rhyme And this time We almost made That love Didn't We was the final recording the singer made with George Martin. His new producer was John Burgess, and things didn't get off to the best of starts. The first album they made was very different, as it purposely covered songs and standards made famous by other singers, a move away from the more contemporary material Matt was now singing. Matt Monroe archivist Richard Moore. They began work on a new album pretty much straight away in November 72, and by January 73, all the recording was finished. But then nothing. The album sat on the shelf for more than two years, only seeing the light of day in April 75. To make matters worse, it wasn't mixed properly. The versions released were um, known as rough mixes, which sometimes used wrong vocal takes and even left in the occasional mistake. If you listen to I'm Glad I'm Not Young Anymore, the track is drenched with reverb, and there's even a glaring mistake in the trumpet section. No more frustration No star-crossed lover am I No aggravation Just one reluctant reply John Burgess also liked to work in a different way. He preferred to record the orchestra and then overdub vocals on later. This was not what Matt wanted. He liked to be in the studio with the orchestra. Although he and John would make two more albums together, none were as satisfying as his work with George. But the partnership did produce some good individual recordings, including his first chart hit of the 1970s. 
course, you've even had a hit in 1973, didn't you, with, with the Vandervelk? Oh, with the Vandervelk, yeah, I level. That sort of helped you a bit. That's it? right, yeah, and you it. smiled, yeah. I've forgotten all about that. Yes, that was <laughs> in the charts. <laughs> I thought that I had the world on the end of a string. I thought that I was a millionaire. Free as the dawn and then came the morning I turned and I saw you there And you smiled and you smiled with laughter in your eyes Then the world seemed to fade away And you smiled and you smiled and I was captured, don't you know I'd like to stay 1977 was a momentous year for Matt, but not always for the right reasons. First and foremost was a surprise by a certain Mr Eamon Andrews. It was an amazing day, but the rule was that the artist couldn't know about the surprise. If so, the show was axed. Matt's code name was Carpet, and there were so many secret phone calls coming to Mickey at the house, and if the singer answered, then the caller hung up. He was convinced his wife was having an affair. She said keeping the secret was the hardest thing she ever had to do. Sammy Davis flew in especially, squared up to the show's guest of honour, and said he only forgave him for singing so good because he was taller than him. Probably a quarter of an inch, if that. It was just a shame that Matt was opening at Talk of the Town that night, so he couldn't stay for the after-show party. Matt Monroe Jr. It was, it was an amazing day, and I remember being back at school after it had been obviously aired, and all these kids had watched it, and, you know, what was television, as in, that's me on the television, that's me dad on the television, and it was just, it was a weird experience, again, because to me, he was just my dad. In fact, during the show that night, one of Matt's brothers suffered a heart attack while sitting in the audience, but it was kept from the singer until he came off stage, and then the whole family headed for the hospital, but thankfully Arthur was OK. What wasn't OK was the tragic loss of Matt's best friend, Johnny Spence, who died suddenly at the age of 42 on the 16th of August 1977. He'd lost many great friends over the decade, including Tony Hancock, Ed Sullivan, Duke Ellington, Mama Cass Elliot, as well as his beloved mother, but Johnny's loss started to tip him over the edge. That and the fact that his career was almost at a standstill. Don Black was in big demand as a songwriter and found it difficult to give the time needed to manage the singer's career. Mickey had urged her husband to leave Don several times over, but this time Matt realised he had no choice. Their contract had only been forged over a handshake, so with each wishing the other one well, they went their separate ways. I think maybe the, some of the people that worked with him and around him were not really the right choice at the time. He'd have had a stronger entourage if we'd thought about it. After we parted company with Don, we went with a guy called John Ashby. Um, it was very, very good for us, very helpful to us. The year also saw the release of Matt's last great hit, he loved the song, but did worry it might be prophetic. In my heyday, young girls wrote to me. Everybody seemed to have time to devote to me. Everyone I saw all swore they knew me. Once upon a song Main attraction Couldn't buy a seat The celebrities, celebrities would die to meet I've had every accolade bestowed on me And so you see If I never sing at all It shouldn't bother me I've had my share of fame You know my name If I never sing another song 
song Or take another bow I would get by But I'm not sure Matt had taken to drinking more to dull the pain of his increasing heartache. He'd always driven himself to gigs in England, but he made it a cardinal rule never to drink and drive, and thank goodness. One night returning late from a successful show with his son, a young man ran across the motorway from a pub on the other side, spack into the headlights of the singer's car. Even though Matt was exonerated from any blame for the accident, the youth's death continued to haunt him, and his career suffered. He cancelled an Australian tour, as well as most of his British and European concerts. The terrible accident affected him more than anything else, and his health, which had not been all that good of late, worsened to a point where he felt he could not face another audience. Matt needed help, and booked himself into Galsworthy. He'd previously been admitted to the Priory in 1976, but the root of the problem was that he simply enjoyed a drink and the doctors established it did not interfere with his everyday life, but it did have a detrimental effect on his liver. It had been damaged at birth when he was taken to hospital with infective hepatitis and spent nearly two years incarcerated. With regular jaundice attacks of late, Matt entered the clinic determined to never drink again, and he didn't, but the damage was done. It took a long time before Mickey persuaded him to go back out on the road again, helped by his return to the hit parade. EMI had released an album called Heartbreakers, which shot straight to number five in March 1980, much to the surprise of the singer. I didn't know it was going to be released. I had no, I hadn't knew nothing about it. It was something conceived by a bloke at EMI, for which I'm extremely grateful. I don't even know that who the fellow was, because he's not at EMI anymore. They just got me a, a gold disc anyway. Although now under new management, Matt's schedule was no less gruelling than in the past. His worldwide success hadn't waned, and contracts came in from across the globe. I'm doing a couple of nights this week with Sid. Uh, that was yesterday and today. Then I've got tomorrow, I'm driving back to London, Friday's off, and I'm working Saturday and Sunday in Birmingham on another tour, which is a smaller tour, which is clubs. I finish, actually, at the end of May when I go to Malta. I go to Malta for three days. And then, I, beginning of June, I go back to Florida. I'm supposed to go to somewhere else in the Middle East. I'm supposed to do a tour there. I'm also supposed to go to the Far East and do a tour there. And in September, I go to South America. In October, I go back to Australia. And then I go back to Florida. So I think from July, I don't think I should be back until the You'll new year. You'll not have much time off. He certainly didn't have much time off. He stopped in the Philippines, where he made a pair of studio recordings, potentially for single release, although that ultimately didn't happen. He also made more recordings in Spanish, which forged a reunion with George Martin, who conducted the orchestra, and Leonardo Schultz, who had originally masterminded the singer's Spanish language tracks. It would turn out to be his last album. <laughs> With a new lease of life, the Monroes made the decision to move to Florida, as it would cut down on Matt's vast amount of travelling and give them a healthier lifestyle. The singer was serious about moving his career forward, wanting the right calibre of work that would propel him to a position in the show business chain that he should have achieved years earlier. He formed a new work strategy, which involved another change of management, this time a large American and PR company eager to promote the British star. Life looked great. I now have bought a place in Florida. I live in a place called Boca Raton, which is about 40 miles north of Miami. And it's quiet and it's spacious. I, I mean, the, the area we live in is spacious, not the house I live in. Um, and it, it's very quiet and it's, it's very hot, which I love. Mm. And I do nothing except play golf and... It's my, I did have a condominium, 
<laughs> Matt and Mickey were thrilled with their new purchase, and in one of their taped letters to their daughter, they revealed the great sense of humour that never left them as a couple. Um, Your mother's changed the carpet and tile <laughs> colours about 900 times. Yes, we're going to see the, the house again. Unfortunately for Daddy, it just cost him $250 because Mummy had the jacuzzi put the wrong side of the pool and she was very unhappy about it. Because so it was aesthetically wrong, do you mind? Your mother said that, it aesthetically. Was, it was aesthetic. aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what it meant was that it was the near side of the house and to get in the pool you had to walk round it, which was fine, except if we were all trying to talk and sit on the steps of the pool, it wouldn't have worked too well. No, you had to walk another six feet. It's so exciting, I can't really believe that we've got this house. Mind it's so you. exciting, wondering how we're going to bloody pay yes, for it. Yes, how we're going to pay for it, that's another thing. The Shrine Auditorium was Matt's first prestigious venue after moving back to the States. It was make or break. He'd reinvented himself and was ready to storm the city and prove he belonged there. The show was a monster, a six-minute standing ovation to nearly 7,000 people, with the crowd refusing to leave. The phone rang off the hook with offers from ABC, CBS, half a dozen other television stations, press agencies and bookers desperate to nab the singer. The prestigious venues toppled in, with offers to work Vegas, San Francisco Symphony Hall, the Sydney Opera House and Carnegie Hall. Matt also signed contracts to record two concerts to video and a brand new album. He was flying high. Having Mickey by his side on tour was a priority. She'd always been his anchor and being able to share his newfound success was the icing on the cake. When the curtain came down and the venue went dark, the boy from Shoreditch was content to enjoy the stillness of the moment, the aftermath of a battle that had left several scars over the years. He'd finally exercised his demons. The offers continued to fly in, but none as good as the news that he'd been offered a six-month residency at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. He finally felt he'd got to where he should have been years earlier. His last interview was quite prophetic. What can I say? I've had more out of my life. In fact, I probably have more out of a year than the average working bloke gets in his lifetime. So if it all finishes tomorrow, I'm ahead. In the second half of 1984, Matt toured Australia for the 15th time, but while there, fell ill and was diagnosed with food poisoning. He flew back to England for one concert at the Barbican, but went to see a specialist while there, as he couldn't shake the feeling of ill health. The Barbican was one of the greatest concerts he did in England, with a standing ovation of seven minutes and a lauded write-up by Peter Heppel in the stage, the industry's Bible. Matt felt that it took leaving the country to live abroad for England to finally accept him. Waiting in the wings to go on, he had beads of sweat on the top of his brow and asked a stagehand to get him a glass of water, something he'd never done in the past. The adrenaline of the past 90 minutes on stage carried him through the numerous people who came backstage to show their appreciation, but by the time Matt was in the car, he was near collapse. He was rushed into the Cromwell Hospital and diagnosed with liver cancer. I remember seeing Matt at uh, the last concert of the Barbican. Don Black. And I've never seen him better. He didn't look very well. But by God did he sing. It was an unbelievable ovation he got. Every song was perfect. I, it's a tragedy that that wasn't recorded because it was him at his peak. It was a flawless performance. He didn't look well at all, but boy, did he go out with all guns blazing. It was a, a magnificent performance. The last time I saw him performing was at the Water Rats Ball. Frankie Vaughan. I don't think he expected to sing and... People kept encouraging him. We said, go on, Matt, you know, just do a couple of numbers. He wasn't well. We got him on the stage and he sat down, took the mic, and he sang like a dream. I know that I was sobbing because I'm easily moved. I knew the boy was fighting for life. And we all miss him so terribly. And we have such fond memories of him. He was, oh, he'd go mad if you could hear me maudling now. He'd say, cut it out, Frank. You know, let's have a beer or something. And, uh, God, we miss him. John Ashby. 
I was going to America uh, for Christmas and the New Year, and I think I was away for about four weeks. Um, and I'd spoken to Matt, and I said, what are you doing for Christmas? He said, I'm just going to have a quiet... He always called me son. He said, I'm going to have a quiet Christmas at home, son, and I'll see you when you get back. And then we'll talk about what we're going to do next year. And I said, great. Uh, and then I was away, and I think I got back uh, probably about the 10th or 12th of January. And when you get back in, you play your message on the answer phone, and about the fifth message in, there was a message uh, from Matt. He said, hello, son. He said, it's Matt. Uh, I'd like a word, I'll never forget it, I'd like a word, uh, ring me on this number, room so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and, so. and I thought, well, that's strange, and I, I, I didn't know any. I rang the, rum, the number, and it was the Cromwell Hospital, and I got through and I spoke to Matt, and that was the first time that I knew that he was sick. During his lifetime, Matt held Sinatra on a pedestal, but it was a mutual admiration society. Sinatra rated the British crooner as one of the three greatest singers in the world. To be recognised by Sinatra was the highest accolade you could get, as he didn't praise many people, and it meant the world to Matt. In fact, one of the last things he read was a telegram that was delivered to the hospital. Sorry to hear you've been taken ill, and hope you'll soon be on the mend and up and about. I send love and prayers, your fellow boy singer, Frank Sinatra. Don and I went to, I'll never forget it, to the University Arms Hotel in Cambridge for a bit of lunch. And the restaurant was pretty empty. I think there was one other table, it was Don and I, and they had piped music on there. And about half past one, Don said, listen. And over the tannoy system came softly as I leave you. And it seemed prophetic in a way. And it was just so poignant. A failed liver transplant spelt the end of one of the greatest singers to ever grace the British shores. On the 7th of February, 1985, the world started to mourn the loss of one of their favourites. There was a very big thing I'd um, called a screen, the crematorium there, and uh, surprisingly great, I don't mean surprisingly great gathering, but a great mixture of people that you wouldn't expect to see in all in one group. Very diverse um, scale of people right across the, the whole scale comics, uh, singers, musicians, bandsmen, uh, actors, uh, managers, agents, producers, uh, all, all the whole, if you could kind of cast a, a net for the show business and pull it in, that, that was there. And they played his music and people sang and uh, I mean it was, it, it wasn't a, a, a downbeat gathering, it was a, a celebration of the man's life. As soon as you put that CD on, or your DVD, or whatever you put on, bump, that's Matt Monroe. He had a great sound, and uh, the minute you heard a note, you knew it was Matt Monroe. That's why he became such a big star. But uh, he was a lovely person, and uh, we certainly miss him, and he, he was such a credit to, to the game. Well, how do they say it here in Britain? Uh, Matt was really a great friend of mine, and I'm more than a fan of his. Uh, he was like a brother to me and treated me so well when I came to Britain the first time and really worked hard at trying to help me out. He sang as well as anybody, absolutely anybody, and he had a wonderful voice. It was a, a God-given voice. Well, you can't be that good and be forgotten. I would have given anything. I don't want to change my style. I never want to change what I do. But had I been able to grasp a little bit of what he did, I'd love to have added it to my voice. I mean, I, I love the man very deeply. Bruce Forsyth, Buddy Greco, Tony Bennett, Johnny Mathis, June Marlowe, Cliff Richard and Dave Allen. Just a few tributes from some of his famous fans. In 1987, a tribute was held at the Grosvenor House Hotel with the Monroe family as honoured guests. The room was littered with names from the music industry and the top table was filled with stars of stage and screen, including David Jacobs, Dave Allen, Leslie Crowther, Bernie Winters, George Martin, Petula Clark and Barbara Windsor. Bruce Forsyth wrote an apology that he couldn't be there, but wanted to say, Matt was one of the finest singers in the world. I often listen to that special tone and that lovely phrasing that was so unique. He was one of my best friends and I'll always miss him. There were so many wonderful messages and speakers who addressed the room at that special dinner, including the singer's show business buddy, 
Bob Monkhouse. But he'd never been to Aeolian Hall in Bond Street. Now, at Aeolian Hall at Bond Street, we had some guy no one could understand. His name was Peg, Peg the Pig. He was a doorman, he was a commissionaire, and he had some security of tenure. God knows why he'd been the Pioneer Corps, got, he'd got a job. And everyone hated this bastard because he was, he was a filthy, disgusting man. He was insulting to everybody, he got, a, he got halitosis, he didn't know, never washed, and he never shaved, never washed his hair. He was disgusting, his uniform was stained, but he held the job for, God knows why, for about four years. But Matt didn't know this man, and we had all had the rough side of this man's tongue. You know, you'd walk in, you'd say, uh, well, which floor is Mr. Bridgemont on? Oh, I don't know, look it up, oh, I'm not here for that. See, so you know, God, I don't know. We longed for this man to be given his comeuppance. And I walked in the first day that Matt came in with Ivor Merantz, who was a beautiful guitar player, and I heard this line. It was a deathless line to us. Because Matt, in all innocence, didn't know Peg the Pig. He walked up this awful man, and he said, excuse me, he said, very politely for Matt. He said, excuse me, could you direct me to the toilets? The man said, can't you find him yourself? And Matt, without missing a beat, said, actually, I was going by my sense of smell, and it led me to you. <laughs> but this is not the end of Matt's story. His music and legacy live on. My mother worked hard to keep his name and music alive, as both myself and my brother continued to do. I wrote Dad's biography, The Singer's Singer, and my brother Matt Jr. toured with an audiovisual stage show, The Matt Monroe Story. My brother had no designs on entering the music business until he was sitting in the audience at a summer season in Yarmouth and his father pulled him up on stage to sing a duet. First time I ever sang with Dad um, was back in 1977. He was doing a summer season at the Windmill Theatre in Great Yarmouth. And unbeknown to me and unbeknown to my dad, uh, they got to the finale of the show and I was brought up onto stage to sing supposedly a duet with my dad and we sang the song yesterday. Now I sang it incredibly badly, but I think what was so fantastic for me was the fact for the first time ever, he wasn't my dad. He was Matt Monroe the singer, and it's the greatest memory of my life that I probably ever had with him. Probably one of his worst, but it was, it was a lovely memory for me. Matt Jr. was only 13, but that experience left an indelible mark on the young boy, and he was eager to repeat the occasion. Sadly, it never came about, but EMI were keen to experiment with a session similar to one that Natalie Cole had done, that of adding her vocals to that of her late father. The result was an album called Matt Sings Monroe. I lusted love before Got mad and closed the door But you said try just once more I chose you for the one Now I'm having so much fun You treated me so kind I'm about to blow my mind And you made me so very happy I'm so glad you came into my life However, Matt Jr. wasn't the only singer in the family. My late brother Mitchell could also carry a tune. You just call out my name And you know wherever I am I'll come running Yeah, yeah, baby To see you again Winter, spring, summer or fall all you gotta do is call And I'll be there Yeah, yeah, yeah You got a friend A recording you made just for fun Just don't ask me to sing Your ears couldn't take it One of Dad's deepest regrets was that he never got a number one in his own country But in 2004 I got a call from Odeon Entertainment who wanted to make a documentary on Dad. They didn't have a great deal of money, so I struck a deal, which included transferring all my old media into the new format. Dad was a lover of films and had these large film canisters in the garage from years back. 
I gave Bob Monkhouse the majority as he was an avid collector, but two reels were unmarked and I nearly threw them away several times over as the costs of getting them transferred ran into thousands at the time. Odeon took them all away and a few weeks later I got a garbled phone call saying that one of them was a full-length concert from Australia and it was in perfect condition. Odeon begged me permission to release it and an evening with Matt Monroe went straight into the DVD charts and knocked Eminem off the number one spot, which my son thought was super cool. So 18 years after his death, Dad got his number one in England. In the last 15 years, with the help of Richard Moore, who now remastered all the albums the estate release, we have searched the world to find rare or unheard material and have tried to make all of Dad's catalogue available in the best sounding versions possible. These include the five-disc Complete Singles Collection, live concerts in Australia, the Philippines and Hong Kong, The Rare Monroe and its follow-up, Matt Uncovered, The Rare Monroe. In fact, that particular album included material that surfaced by chance and held an incredible surprise. Matt Monroe archivist and sound engineer Richard Moore. In 2010, I was researching the radio shows Matt made for Rediffusion in Hong Kong and I came across a man called Gerald Dalmada and he'd worked in Hong Kong with Matt and he told me of a session he produced in the UK for Rediffusion's library music service arm called ReadyTune. I managed to track down their whereabouts and they confirmed they had some Matt Monroe recordings. All the rights and legal stuff took ages to sort out. Mickey Monroe. My favourite song of Matt's, well, my favourite of all time, was uh, My Funny Valentine. This was a song my dad always sang live to mum, but he never recorded it, or so we thought. It took 18 months until we received the track list from ReadyTune. Among the 14 tracks listed, there sat My Funny Valentine. What was even more incredulous was the date the email arrived, the 14th of February. My funny... Valentine, sweet comic Valentine, you make me smile with my heart. Your looks are laughable. Unphotographable Yet you're my favourite work of art Some of the rarest material featured in this series has survived thanks to the many loyal fans. One in particular was Sue Maul, who started following Matt Monroe from the days of Noel Gordon's lunchbox at the tender age of 14. She was completely smitten and recorded as many television and radio shows as she could in the early years, and we are very grateful that she did. Richard Moore. Now, Matt made more than 300 TV and radio appearances, but only a small number of those survive in the archive. And it's typical. If there's one show from a series that Matt appeared in that's missing, it would be the one that Matt was in. Uh, Eurovision 1964? Visuals all gone for that. And the 1966 Royal Variety Show, uh, Morecambe and Wise first BBC series. Of course, who knows what people have got hidden away. And it's always great to hear from people who've got things. December 2020 would have been Dad's 90th birthday. And to celebrate, we released the album of previously unheard versions of his lost New York sessions, Stranger in Paradise, which reached number eight in the charts and has spent five months in the top 30. We also asked a few more of his famous fans if they had any special messages they wanted to share. Joe Montagna starts us off. I first learned about Matt, I think, when I was a teenager and saw the movie From Russia With Love and after the movie thinking, who sang that song? Who is that guy? And of course, I found out soon enough that he was one of the great crooners of all time, right along there with Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Johnny Mathis and all the great singers of, of my era and, and uh, and so I was fortunate enough to have met his daughter, met his son, not fortunate enough to have met Matt himself. But all I could tell you is that his music has certainly been a big part of the soundtrack of my life. And so I salute Matt, my best to his family, 
And uh, I'll just be forever grateful that the songs and sound of Matt Monroe have been a big part of my life. Hello, my name is Helen Shapiro, and I'm honored to have been asked to share in Matt Monroe's 90th anniversary celebration, which also happens to be the 60th anniversary of his first hit record, Portrait of My Love. I have happy memories of working with Matt several times, especially at the London Palladium. What a great performer he was, with an instantly recognizable, beautiful voice. I used to stand in the wings and watch him every performance, and my favorite song was Softly As I Leave You. Every time I heard it, without fail, it brought tears to my eyes. Great memories of a great singer. I send my best wishes to Matt's family and to all those who are celebrating these very special anniversaries. Hi, this is Bernie Clifton. Matt Monroe was our greatest ever singer of popular ballads. I mean, America, there was Vic Damone, Jack Jones, Sinatra, but we had Matt Monroe. His phrasing, his technique, his treatment, he was top man, as indeed um, those sentiments echoed by Sinatra himself. Uh, I've got a record that's my go-to record. It's Matt singing on days like these. And it still gets to me every time I play it. It's absolutely brilliant. Hello, I'm Bobby Crush. And this was a big hit for Matt Monroe. <laughs> Portrait of My Love, which is on my jukebox at home. I play it very uh, often, and it's one of my favourite records. I was always a big fan of uh, Matt's. I was lucky enough to work a few times with Matt on various concert dates, and uh, I was very privileged to be able to stand in the wings and watch him perform. And uh, I was in awe of him because not only was he very stylish, but he had great musical sense in that he never chose to perform a song that wasn't 100% right for his voice. But anyway, along with all of his other fans and friends, I would like to acknowledge uh, Matt's 90th birthday and his wonderful career in show business. He is a true legend and he was a wonderful singer. Hello everybody, uh, my name's Duncan Norvell and I'm a big fan of Matt Monroe. And when they asked me to talk about this man, all I can say is just what an amazing, amazing voice. You see, it was different. He, he had the perfect diction. He was just so charismatic when he sang. There will never be another one. If only I could have worked with him, I'd have asked him to chase him. <laughs> Lance Ellington here. I've got to say how thrilled I was when you asked me if I'd say a few words about the incredible Matt Monroe. Well, as a child growing up in the Ellington household with my father, Ray Ellington, there was very rarely a day that went by that we didn't listen to your dad's records and listen to his incredible, incredible vocals. And uh, I myself have been greatly influenced over the years of singing by your father and her, his amazing voice and always strive really to get to be as great as him and uh, i love your father his music and uh, it's an incredible legacy that he's left and uh, i'm very very happy to say a few words and of course to wish him a very happy which would have been 90th anniversary hi there anton dubeck here i just want to do in a few words and i'm not sure how one does it in a few words just say and express what matt munro and his voice and his songs meant to me and as i say it's very very difficult i grew up listening to matt munro and his songs and when i started dancing we were dancing to his his music um and I've listened to it through my whole life. It's one of these things I've never stopped listening to. He's got the most, most brilliant, brilliant voice. I absolutely love it. When I sing, I think I always sound like a cross between uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and Matt Munro. It appears that I sound a bit like Sammy Munro and Matt Davis Jr. So, uh, but I'm still working at it. 
it, it has been an inspiration to me for as long as I can remember. That voice just carries you along. I know it's going to be his 90th anniversary of the uh, of his birth, and well, he is even still now. When I'm in the car and I'm driving and I want to listen to something, I invariably go to Matt Munro. So much love and um, happy anniversary. A travelling salesman of songs, Matt Munro's only gimmick was his outstanding durable vocal talent, plus the out-and-out -out class to survive any passing fad in the notoriously fickle world of pop music. Since 1960 to his last days on earth, he had never been out of work. He didn't have to have a hit to survive. He was one of the best ambassadors of British music, our greatest post-war vocalist in his own particular field. Sadly, never fully appreciated in this country. Great songs in his book are those that last and become standards. Songs which are internationally acclaimed by everyone, had masses of appeal, stand the test of time and even 60 years later given a new treatment could still sound good. The past never sleeps nor does good music. To really understand Matt Monroe, all you have to do is listen. His voice is the clue to his humanity, and through his music, Matt lives on. He is irreplaceable. I'll leave you with a short poem, written and read by Barry Cryer at Matt's Grosvenor House tribute. There could never be a portrait of my life, because nobody could write the script. There could never be a portrait of my life, because my life was soared and dipped. So I'll settle for the friends along the way, as the tapestry of life has been unfurled. Friends like Matt, who had welcome written on. To my mind, that's my kind of world. So raise a glass tonight and toast the lad himself. There's really nothing more I have to say, so softly as I leave you, I join with all the mates. God bless you, Matt. And now, I'll walk away. Thank you. You've been listening to the final part of Matt Monroe, The Boy from Shoreditch. The script was written and presented by Michelle Monroe and produced by Richard Moore. This was a Minter Monroe production. Take my Stranger in Paradise, The Lost New York Sessions. The critically acclaimed top ten album. Matt Munro's Broadway sessions released for the first time in their original form. Also includes a bonus disc featuring 27 of Matt's best recordings, including Born Free, Portrait of My Love and Walk Away. See the links in the YouTube or Mixcloud description for more details. Matt Munro live in Hong Kong 1962. Released for the first time anywhere, Matt's complete concert recorded for the Operation Santa Claus charity is presented alongside an interview taped prior to the concert and rare radio recordings. See the links in the YouTube or Mixcloud description for more details.